Um, so the presentations are next week, right? So um, how many groups are there? How many? Uh, so what's the group number one? I guess you are one, two, three, four. Are you part of a group? Or? Uh, we're in our different groups. Different groups, so, so five? So So there are five groups, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, Jerry is a uh, sixth one. So there are six groups. So we'll allocate the time um, according. I can't do the math right now, but 75 divided by six, right? Um, so you're free to do how you, I mean, the presentation will be here. All of us will be sitting here. And I expect everyone to ask questions on, on how things go, right? It's better that you ask questions than, than make me answer, ask, right? Um, but don't like pay off your friends so they ask like simple questions like, wow, this is a great project kind of thing, right? Um, we don't have much time, so unfortunately we'll have to kind of hurry up. So let's shoot for about 10 minute presentation and then a couple of minutes for questions because I think that's the, that's the thing. So don't try to um, impress us with the most complicated, I mean, you might have given presentations. If you have never given presentation, one of the things that you don't want to do is impress us by having a graph that no one understands what's going on. The goal here is for you to convince me and the class that you've done something interesting, worthwhile. The goal here is not to um, leave me with the impression that I have no idea what you did, because obviously I need to give you grades, right? So your presentation, give me the best, the, the bigger, big, big picture of what you're trying to do and what you expect to happen, right? Um, and what you found, right? So to the extent that possible. But the most important part is you want to say, I want to analyze the performance of Z file system, right, or, or something, right? And, and give some motivation of like something about what ZFS is and what you kind of expect. And one of the things you can be able to express that is you can have like schematic graphs, right? So you may be able to say what we expect is a graph where the performance as you change something will go like this, right? It can be hand drawn, you don't have to uh, draw the actual plot. You expect, you can say this is what we expected, and then what we found was, you know, something which is like uh, going off like this, and some hypothesis on why you're going, right? But but the most important part is tell us what you're trying to do, and sort of what you what you um, what you what you get, okay, so we can kind of follow along, right? And you don't have to use a PowerPoint if you uh, if you can use the board or what have you, but though. PowerPoint may be a lot easier than anything else, right? And I think you have a laptop connection here, so you can connect your laptop to um, to the presentation, right? Um, if you have any doubts about those, send me send me a note. But essentially, it's free form. You're free to do whatever you want. Just try to follow the model of what works for you to uh, explain the group. I expect all of you in the group to uh, contribute to the, to the presentation. I'd like all of you to come and uh, make a presentation, right? So if you have a group of two, um, you can kind of arrange it so that one person gives half the talk, another person gives half the talk, right? Uh, so I'm not saying how you should go, you know, so don't, you probably don't want to like have one sentence where you say one word, the other person says one word kind of thing, but you know, sort of, sort of arrange it among yourself, which we works. Because I need to grade both of you, so I don't want one, of one person to completely sit and the other person use a talk, right? Does that make sense? Another clarification for the homework uh, assignment, next homework assignment. Uh, when I gave this example, I didn't mean to say that you have, for exokernel, you have to give the, the pros as extensibility and safety, and for uh, cons, you have to give extensibility and performance. It's just an example, right? I just want you to give pros and cons for each approach. The intent here was it may be possible that one attribute is in both the pros and cons, depending on how you look at it. So in this example, extensibility could be a positive and a negative, right? It's also possible that you, you don't have anything to say about performance in terms of pros or what have you, right? So but, but this does not mean that for exokernels you have to give all the heading like this, right? What I don't want you to do is like go off and start writing um, pages and pages of stuff. Um, the logistically, I don't have a TA, so I can't grade um, if you wrote like a whole thesis on the, the different stuff. So keep it keep it crisp, so it makes my life a little easier. So I'm, I'm just gonna read a few sentences. So if you go off on a long tangent, so I'm just gonna choose randomly a couple of sentences, and if it happens to be what you want, meant, you're in luck. If not, you're in trouble, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I can't believe that the, um, 
fall break is coming pretty close. Uh, yeah, so today's paper is sort of bizarre, right? How many of you like the paper? It, it's, it's a lot more easier paper to read than the other papers. Um, and it's a function of time, right? So if you look at, if you kind of follow along, um, the older the papers were, the less, um, they're more free-flowing. They, they, they were able to say whatever they want. And you can see the more of the, the math background in the older papers, the newer ones are, have to be a lot crisper on, on what, you know, how they present the stuff, right? Um, and it, I think it happens in most conferences because the, the, I guess the fields are getting competitive and people have to kind of explain what they're trying to do. This is a kind of bizarre paper because every time you read the paper, you go like, what? I mean, it changes everything that you thought you know about what, what to happen. I think that's one of the reasons why this paper was controversial. It's, it's an interesting different idea, right? So essentially the idea here is, you do everything you you can do with other techniques, which is you you um, you can you can put change the code. You detect when something is going wrong, right? But rather than throwing an exception, you just give it some some value and hope things will work out. I think in the second page they say we didn't know how far we can go with this. I mean, we had this crazy idea that if you get into a problem, we just give you some values and we didn't know how far it will go, but turns out it's applicable for a large class of applications, right? So they're, they're not really saying this is the best technique, but they were like, we didn't really think it'll work that well, but it turns out in practice it works a lot, right? So when, when error happens, we just give you some results. And if you are lucky, if we are lucky, then the results we give you would cause something else to fail. Our results we give you may let something go, and you're okay, right? So one of the examples they gave was, you know, if, they, if there's a buffer overflow and you have a long uh, from field more than what you expected, right? Rather than give you error, I truncate it to whatever I can hold, right? So your from field will no longer look like a proper thing. It, may, it might work for you in some cases. In some cases, the server will return that such a user does not exist. So in some cases, you may not be able to reply to the stuff. In some cases, it might work, right? But for the most part, it sort of works, right? How many of you like the, the, the concept? It's a bizarre, like, we, you know, it feels like, no, this is, this is wrong about everything we said, we, we, we know, right? So, uh, so, so I was looking at the, the, um, the reviews, and three of them kind of stand out. One is the notion of, um, I think somebody mentioned CT, you know, mission critical stuff, right? For CT scanners and MRIs and, and mission critical stuff. This is obviously sort of, bad thing, right? You don't want to give some results and make it go. Um, you want to um, crash those, right? Is, is, that, is that really true? I think, I think it sort of goes with the, uh, yeah, with the, with the last comment, right? Last comment somebody mentioned that, they mentioned that there are some, the, the, the main idea that makes this work is you have, um, the short error propagation distance, right? So if you have a system where the error can propagate to a long piece of code, this won't work, right? So if you're running, say, uh, a, a, a scientific computation which has to run for a week, right? On the first initialization, you have a problem. You give it a fake results, right? Then you expect that the whole thing to be wrong because you know the initial reading of the data was wrong, so the whole thing is kind of wrong. But in the case is very short, right? Where whatever you do will cause something as short as possible. So in the case of the, uh, the, the mail reader, right? It has a problem with the from field. So it shows what, what, what is wrong with the from field on that particular message. But if you go to the next message, that's completely orthogonal to what you were doing before so that it kind of works, right? So you have to buy into that notion that there are this notion of short and long and there is no scientific basis for this except for the gut feeling of saying if it has to go for a long period of time, then it's probably not going to work. They, they can't prove what, what it is here. I'm not sure that it would be bad in mission critical systems. Mm -hmm. It seems that I mean, if you had something like air traffic control system based on GPS and you read data from the GPS receiver, and if certainly uh, occasionally the data was too long and you know overflowed because mm -hmm. the latitude and longitude was too long, and the next reading could be okay. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem that it would necessarily be that. I think that's the problem with this whole approach, right? It, it's it's it doesn't feel scientific on why these things should work. 
So even at the, the CT, MRI scan, right? So they have a notion that there's some irrelevant computations. And I think one of you mentioned that if, there, if it is irrelevant, why don't you take it out of the code? Why, why couldn't the compiler com take it out of the thing, right? They don't have a notion of what irrelevant computation is. They don't know what it is. They just assume that there are some computations which are not life-threatening, right? So in those, you could, you could probably get along, right? So in the case of GPS, if the GPS was on a missile which is going to hit something, uh, missile is a bad example because you don't really care. I mean, if you consider this enemy territory, you don't really care where exactly it is, right? So you're landing an airplane, right? So if, if the GPS is being used for landing, right, and if, the, if you do this, do this stuff, so you can imagine a case where instead of landing on the runway, it lands like, you know, a few kilometers off on the on, on some houses, right? So that's that's bad, right? But the GPS may be used as a dis to display it on the to the pilot screen where you're flying, right? So I think when they mean the irrelevant computation, it's a computation which has some meaning, right? But it's being displayed, so it's not consequential. It's it's still relevant, but it's not consequential in the sense that if a pilot suddenly realizes that they're trying to land in Denver, it shows that you're in New York City. Nothing really bad happens. The pilot may be confused, they're okay. But on the other hand, if that was to give into the aircraft and it lands in a different location, then it's wrong, right? So the irrelevant is not well defined, but it's sort of. Yeah. Well, it's hard to even say that that's a bad thing because, yeah, the GPS might say you're over houses or you're over mm -hmm. a runway when you're really over houses, but is that better or worse than the GPS? crashing and becoming unresponsive and unusable at all because you got bad data and the machine is just like, whoa. That, that's, that's the hardest, that's the that's, that's excellent point, right? Even in the case of CT, uh, MRI, that somebody was saying like, you know, like if you have a laser pointing and, and burning, uh, burning some tissue off, right? It's a, you know, doing something invasive, right? So with this approach, they'll feed it some value, right? So you may either get fried or you may just, not, I mean, you know, the, the dosage may go up, dosage may remain the same, or it may go down, right? So with this approach, they say, well, it may happen that, you know, you, you could either go down, you could go remain the same, or it could go up. We can't scientifically prove which way it'll go, but only one in three chance that you're gonna, you know, gonna fry you, right? But the other approach, which is fail crashing, is bad, right? Wouldn't it be better to just turn off the radiation stream than to have a one in three chance of frying the patient? So it depends on what the, the assumption would be, right? So in the case that if you can turn, if they can turn it off, then it's, then you should go with that model, right? In the case that you cannot turn it off, right? So I think the other example they gave us the nuclear power plant, right? Um, for nuclear power plants, I don't know what the right answer is, right? I don't think they know what the right answer is too, right? You, you would want to shut it down. I think, I think the other uh, assumption is you may not know that the error is happening, right? And, and if it happens, in some cases, you, you, can, you could shut it off and then recover nicely. But in many cases, you may not have the opportunity to, to shut down, right? So that, that's where this, this paper gets kind of iffy, right? It, it's, it's, if you, have, if you have data that you don't know what it's going mean, to, you know, that's going to theoretically crash the machine, you don't necessarily know that it's going to crash the machine in such a way that the machine becomes unusable. It could crash the machine such, or cause, you know, bad behavior in the same way that this, this technique can But, but see, behavior. this one requires you to find out that there is error kind of happening, right? You cannot do that. I don't think you can do this on the sea. You have to do this on the safe sea, right? right. So you have to first recognize there's a problem, right? So at that point, you have two, two, only two options. One. I mean, well, without the system. If, if you have the radiation and you have bad data, mm -hmm. the, the, where you're reading from some random location, yeah. for instance, then there's still a one in three chance that you're reading up, down, or say the same, if mm -hmm. you're gonna read from a random location. The, the safe C just says, we're just gonna return a random value. The unsafe C says, we're gonna return the value that happens to be in this register or this memory location that you tried to read. So. No, I, I think in, this, in the, sa the safe C case, you know, you have to be able to detect that something is going wrong, right? So if you can detect it, the only option is either shut off or go, go on, right? Okay, so you're saying in the safe C, if you, you can either do the, the, the oblivious one where you return something random yeah. or you can shut off. Yes. Yeah, you can shut off. I mean, this is not competing with the, with the vanilla C, right? Oh. 
I mean, you have to be able to detect errors, right? So if you can't detect errors, this won't work, right? If you if you are in a case where in the GPS or in the CT scan, I don't know where, where I am, right? If the, if the software did not know that whether this is right value or wrong value, right, through some mechanism, this won't work, right? So you have to be able to detect it, but once you detect it, you can either crash out or you can let it go, right? Yeah, I guess I kind of saw a gradation example of if you're reading bad value and it's overflow, then you just return negative one or some sort of mm -hmm. condition that means something to, you know, radiation emitting device that I don't have data at this point. Mm -hmm. It can do something. Um, well, I think that's just the trade-off, right? Like, there are some cases where you want failure to mean I failed, shut off, stop, mm -hmm. you know, don't pass go, don't collect two hundred dollars. And there's some cases where you're like, well, I really want the machine to keep working because mm -hmm. I really don't want bad users to be able to ruin this experience for everybody. So we'll just return something random, and for everybody else, they'll see what they expect to see, and that person who's being a jerk is going to get, you know, something random. So I think it depends on what the usage of the system is. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, it, it 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 depends, but 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 the the problem is. It sounds so unscientific, right? They, 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 they do try to make it look like whatever, but it, at the end, it's all heuristic, right? At, at the end, the problem of figuring out, I mean, so you can detect when a, when a problem is happening, right? But what to do about it depends on the particular scenario, right? The compiler cannot really, so when you said return minus one, right, minus one, at best, they can hope that minus one is something that some other code catches and does something. They have no, they have no way of guaranteeing from the compiler that negative one is the wrong thing to return, right? So maybe in the application code, it could be zero, right? If the, if the, the code may expect a value of zero to be something, it does not expect negative one, so it, it, it fails, right? Um, and I don't think they can actually do that. I mean, they, they can even get there, right? Be able to figure out what is, so, as long as you return some good, bad values, this is valuable, right? But we don't know what those good, bad va values are, right? So I think, I think the, the case of the CT scan and all those things depends on you being able to return a good, bad value where things will kind of move along, yeah? I think in the CT scan case, uh, they have like the, at any cell, mm -hmm. when they put the laser on, mm -hmm. there are other consequences. So it's not totally that it's irrelevant with respect to the other computation. So when it hits the cell, mm -hmm. it has some attenuation factor that would affect some mm -hmm. coding cells. Mm -hmm. So they can't just stop at some point. Okay. To be sure, like something, I mean, the safety is the foremost problem. Okay, so you can't turn it off? Uh, I, th I mean, if you can, then it, it has, and you have to take into account the effect on the neighboring cells also. Okay. So it's like kind of a sense of atomic uh, with respect to some region. Okay. So, the, the, so this is apparently something with the CT scan itself, right? So from, from the, yeah, so, yeah, so there may be other reasons why you may go with that, right? But from, from, a, from, a, from a programming perspective, right? If your code modifies some data which is not, which, if it modifies some data structure which corrupts the whole thing, then all bets are off. I mean, this, this won't protect you. So the error detection mechanism has to be clear on what exactly you're corrupting, right? So the buffer overflow is an easy, easy case because you can kind of know that when you allocate the buffer, you know what you allocated and, and overflow may be detectable. But in other cases, it may not be possible, right? So if you have a long array, and if you're well within the bounds, but you're still writing something you're not supposed to, you, you don't know, right? The underlying theme here is, I, th I think some of you mentioned in like different forms, is it's best to write bug-free code, right? I don't think anybody's disagreeing with that part, right? I don't think this author's anybody saying that you should write buggy code, right? We, we, we want bug-free code. In fact, I've never met anyone who says they want to write a buggy code, right? I mean, we all try to write bug-free code. Everybody maintains that we have writing bug-free code, right? I mean, nobody, none of the vendors are trying to write a bug, uh, bu you know, code, buggy code, right? So this is a like, last line of protection. I mean, so it, you know, don't. So they also warn you that if you think of this as the first line of protection, which you may, because once you begin to use the system, then your the number of um, bug reports that you get will probably plummet, right? Because most of the cases are being um, it's patched over by the system, so you may get far fewer bug reports. So you, as a developer, kind of kind of get into this stuff that 
okay, I wrote this piece of code, and I'm getting a lot fewer bug uh, failures because something, you know, they seem to kind of go, go, okay. So if you get into that mode, this approach is bad, right? You don't want it to get into that mode. I mean, this is sort of sounds like the financial, you know, the uh, model has that problem that people keep talking about, right? But essentially, you want to make sure that people still write as bug-free code as possible, right? And I think that's a big if, because I think if, if it starts to, um, some of you may realize this, right? So when you write like simulations and, and other stuff for your own projects, right? How many of you thoroughly verify every step that you you did? So, if, so for the benchmarks, right? You ran the benchmark, if it produced a result, right? If it produced like 43, 54, 55, right? How many of you went back and like looked at each step of the what it did to make sure that the results you got were what you would have expected? Meaning, if you, if you if I had replaced your benchmark with the failure oblivious code, where when it had a bug, it just randomly made up some number, right? So the, the results you're getting is basically pseudo random, right? How many of us would go and fix that, right? So whether they like it or not, if they if they have a fairly obvious code, I think a lot of the, the the programmers will get even more lazier, right? But if you don't do that, if you if you still continue to try to write as bug free code as possible, this may work, right? Um, under the under the under the, under the uh, arguments that they said, right? And I think one of the comments people made was uh, I think Jerry made it was they seem to know what kind of a problem memory problems that they're going to face and fix those, right? So they look at buffer overflow. They, they look at some, some memory problems. And it's not clear if it will solve all memory corruption issues. It only solves a certain number of issues, right? What, what, do, what do you feel about that observation? That this is not true for all possible memory issues. It's only true for certain issues like buffer overflows and stuff like that. Is that a yeah? Better to solve some than to solve none. Yeah, that that's that yeah that so um, so that argument is it, it's true for any system, right? I mean, you would love to build a system which is optimal in every case, right? But practically, you take one step at a time. So you they're, they're only looking at some problems. There are other problems that they don't solve, but that's that's such is life, right? I mean, they can't solve all the problems, right? And, and the buffer overflow problem is, is it's well known. It's been around for a long time. It, it's, it's one of those things where you should have been taught in programming 101 what buffer overflow is, right? If you haven't been taught, then it's a failure of the system because you guys are going to go off and write programs which are going to go buffer overflow. And you would think that at this point, you, will, you won't see any of those, but it happens over and over again, right? Because it, for some reason, programmers tend to run into problems where buffer overflow happens a lot. And buffer overflow is usually used as security, as a mechanism to attack a system, right? So I, I, it's a very normal way to attack a system using buffer overflow. It's a, it's a well-known problem. The solution is well-known, but it still keeps happening because the programmers keep doing that. So even though they're seemingly attacking a, a smaller set of systems, that particular thing has been bugging us for a while. I mean, this is a simple problem, we know the simple solution, but we still keep making the problem over and over again, and they're trying to solve those issues, right? But I think, I think what their point is, as long as you know what, you, you can detect when, a, when, a, when you're accessing something that you're not supposed to, the system can work, right? So I don't think it's, it's related to just buffer overflow. As long as you're, you're, you have a way to detect that you're accessing something that you're not supposed to, the system can work, right? So all it all it does is if you're trying to read something you're not supposed to read, it'll give you some random value. As long as you're trying to write something that you're not supposed to, it'll ignore whatever your write is, right? But you have to first know how to detect that. So if I write into some which is in my own address space, some area that I, I seem to have access to, but I'm modifying it because of a logical error, this approach cannot work because it does not know about logical errors, right? But if you're accessing something you're not supposed to access because of uh, bounce checks is much easier to do, right? So that's what they attack. And they also agree that these bounce checking systems make the system work uh, three or four times slower, right? Because now every access has to go through, you have to write a wrapper code basically uh, to see whenever you're accessing something. So whenever you, you allocate some data structure, it keeps track of those. So it keeps track of all the stuff that you have, all the data structure that you have, 
And if you try to access some data, it makes sure that it's, it's within the stuff that you allocated. If you're trying to access something which is beyond what you allocated, then this stuff kicks in, right? So it's a simple technique, but what reality means that you have to have a compiler which takes your code, every time you allocate something, it, it keeps track of what you allocated. Every time you free something, it keeps track of what was reallocated. Every time you make a memory reference, it has to monitor what you're accessing and, and so on, right? Have, have you seen that kind of a system somewhere else in, in this system where you, you keep track of what is being, what you're accessing and keep track of what is not being accessed? Yeah. But, but, but in a more generic sense, like in, in regular operating system, um, have you seen something like that? It's, it's not a trick question, right? Basically, all the virtual memory and all those things basically do the, try to do that, right? The whole operating system uses something like this. You know, it, it has an, the, the way you implement virtual memory is essentially to keep track of which pages are being accessed and, and you know, maintain page tables and, and, and bits and have the hardware tell you, right? The reason why the, hard, the operating system does not pay this penalty is because you have hardware support, right? When you run your program, the, the, the operating system sets up the page table such that it knows what you can access and what you cannot access, right? And the hardware gives you feedback, right? And they're facing this penalty because the hardware is not helping them. The hardware does not know that even though this heap was allocated to you, so, so what, what really happens is, so suppose you have a program which has a certain amount of heap, right? Your heap is where you do your, it just is a uh, rectangle with the, with the heap, right? So you have, which is where you, you do your allocation for malloc and stuff, right? So when you do a malloc of one, right? Your program, rather than asking the operating system for one extra byte, right? Amortizes the cost and asks for a larger chunk, right? And typically it's at least a page, right? So at least ask for a page, which is let's say uh, 4K. But typically you ask for a lot more. Typically you ask for uh, like say megabyte or something. So you ask the operating system for a megabyte. You give this application this one byte that they asked for, right? And you have this rest of the memory as a heap given to your application. So from the operating system perspective, it knows that you have this one megabyte worth of data, right? From your application perspective, you only allocated this little chunk, right? Then if you do it, so let's say malloc for another byte, you may allocate it here. Let's say another byte, you may allocate it here. And then you may free the second one, in which case the middle one becomes free, right? So eventually what happens is your application may only use certain chunks of what was allocated to you, right? So from operating system perspective, if you write anywhere from here to here, that's legal, right? You don't get any protection failure because it's all allocated to you. The hardware support only goes from here to there. But from a logical perspective, if you access some variable that was once allocated and now deallocated, then that's essentially what your buffer overflow and all, all those things are happening, right? So this is, this is stuff that is given to the process, but you don't want, the application is not supposed to write into it because that leads to a logical failure, something that the operating system cannot capture, right? And that's essentially what they're trying to solve, right? So if you were to go beyond this, then your, your vanilla operating system would kick in. If you access something which is beyond what was given to you as a heap, then you get a segmentation fault, life is a lot more easier, different, or whatever, right? Whereas in, in this case, this is a chunk of memory that is given to you, and now you are doing something, right? So if you want to take it even further, it may so happen that this is allocated to you, but logically, this processor should only modify this piece of variable. So if you modify something else, then it has to detect these things, right? So that's how it fits into this memory stuff. So this paper, I kind of moved it from uh, way down to here because it kind of fits in with the notion of a failure that we looked at in the last paper. But it's really about memory system corruption, right? Because this memory was allocated to you, but so, the corruption cannot be found by the operating system, but it can be found by something like this, right? So the assumptions here are, you have to write bug-free code. Nobody's denying that. 
but turns out that you wrote bug, bug, bug full code, which seems to happen a lot. And when you write a bug full code, if I can detect when you're creating a bug, right, where you're trying to read or some, write something that you're not supposed to read, then I can either kill you, right, make you exit, and then uh, recover you from, from wherever you are, or do the stuff where I kind of give you some fake values, and then you move along, right? So, is this related to logical bugs in your program and their outcome, right? For example, PowerPoint, right? There may be a logical bug in PowerPoint where it's writing to some data structure it's not supposed to write, right? And I'm getting some results which I'm not supposed to get, right? Which is still a bug, but no, known to nobody because it's, it's writing something, right? So instead of writing into variable A, it's writing into variable B. And your program kind of works because it's a bug. It may cause some damage, which no one knows what it is, because if, if you knew, then Microsoft, let's say, would fix it, right? How do you compare this with that, right? The case where there's a bug, something is being modified that is, you're not supposed to be modified, but you continue to use the program, versus here where something in the system detects something is wrong, but it kind of gives you a fake result and it lets you move. Are they the same? Is one more worse than the other? Did, it, did that make sense? How many of you believe that your, the, the application that you're using has bugs that, that you don't detect in the normal case? So the rest of you don't believe that the systems you work have no have bugs? How many of you believe that the systems that you use have no bugs? How many of you have no opinion? So I didn't see anybody, anything from these folks, right? So do you believe that a normal application that you use has bugs that may cause something that you didn't, you didn't mean, you didn't, you didn't want to see, but you didn't detect it? kind that are the hardest to find, mm -hmm. the hardest to, even if somebody notices them, they're hard to recreate, mm -hmm. hard to fix. Mm -hmm. So the more complicated something gets, the more likely little things there are like that. But if it doesn't break anything serious, you might not ever see it. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like that's the sort of logic they use, right? I mean, even in the cases where they do know what's going on, um, most of the times, a lot of people don't seem to care or uh, worry about bugs anyway, so we'll just fix it and kind of move along, right? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a bizarre paper, but I think it's a... I like the paper because it kind of makes you wonder what happens, right? Um, if you buy into this notion that you can create, you can solve the bugs by kind of making something up as you go along, right? Um, I wonder if, if that's what Microsoft does too. I mean, if they, um, if you have some bugs which no one seems to complain about, and it's kind of like if you have like a ten-page document, right? The page numbers go from one to nine, and then it goes to let's say A or something, right? If no one really complains about it, and it's kind of uh, it's been around, right? then you get into this sort of thing, well, you know, like nobody really complained, no one seems to have lost anything about with it, so we kind of move along, right? So this is the slides from the authors. So they actually have more data than what was in the paper. I think they were working on it for a couple of years on, on, on solving this thing. Um, yeah, so one of the, so obviously this is, this is the memory module section that we are looking at. So uh, memory, you know, which is, which is you, you want to store something and because of program errors, a lot of, lot of bad things happen, right? So what, what is, I think somebody mentioned on your reviews, what is one case where this whole idea would, is a bad idea, right? Can you think of like one case where this whole idea of oblivious computing is a bad idea behind, beyond the short versus long stuff, right? 
actually it may be, it could be from the from the long stuff right i think some of you mentioned the, the the problem of storage right if you were to store those values then it then it it perpetuates right so if you do failure oblivious computing i make up some value but if it happens to be stored somewhere then the next time you come around then that value gets read so it 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 stays on forever so this is a bad idea right hopefully this is short enough that you kind of forget what you did and then you start off with the new stuff so the web server and all those things it's you 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 go to the next next uh, uh, next request you forget about exa entirely about what you did before so you're kind of good but if it were to write it back into a into a uh, storage system or something then this made up values kind of tend to propagate so if you do this for a database system i think for a database system this is a really bad idea right the database systems modify some data and then they probably write it back into the disk so if you start adding these spurious values eventually you're going to get a database which has lots of random numbers and and you don't you don't get what you want right um so the way to solve them is to have you can do dynamic checks and 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 and, and in the runtime and and figure out what to do um and if you have invalid access so so you need that functionality you need a functionality to figure out that something is going wrong right so this whole system only works if you can figure out that something is going wrong and th the choice has changed right so if you have a, a thing you, you they assume that there may be cases where you can still keep going and still not cause catastrophic damage and the proof is we've done it on a whole number of systems and it seems like you can you can go for a lot of systems um so instead of throwing so you do whatever you did before instead of throwing exception instead of killing the process you let it go uh, so if you try to read something that you're not supposed to read i gave you some made up value right and it works for the most of the time because you're not supposed to be reading that anyway so if you're reading something out of bounds right you you shouldn't have read that part so nobody said that you can read something there so I'm, even if i make something up right it it couldn't be too bad as long as you don't go off and and write this value or, or do something with the stuff and if you're trying to write something beyond the the array i just silently drop it i never send say anything back to the application because these applications cannot deal with uh, if i say something so so if you write beyond the buffer i just drop the the once which are kept to the memory and let you go right and for the most part you will be fine yeah right is fine you discuss the value mm -hmm. but why do we really care to manufacture a value and present it to the user i mean from the short propagation distance mm -hmm. is it really necessary i mean can't we just tell give whatever was there so i think it comes to the, so did, it, did did that make sense so if you're trying to protect for the for the read bound case right so if you're reading something that you're not supposed to read why manufacture something right give you whatever was there is that that's your thing right would well, they explain that when they said uh, if you're trying to read something in a loop then it's determining the definition of a loop is going to be what you read so if you don't manufacture something that the loop expects it's just going to be an infinite loop and mm -hmm. that's worse than just mm -hmm. or potentially worse than just yeah, that's fine I mean, for the loop reading code it makes sense but for you know, in general sense i mean when it, a user gives some request and you give him a manufactured value or whatever and it doesn't make sense from the user's perspective so that i think i think the value uh, the answer goes more for security right so in the, in the security context if i don't want you to read something you're not supposed to have which is within your namespace like your password or, or whatever right so you hope that i won't let you read something that you're not supposed to have so if your password was decrypted and is somewhere in memory right so here i'll give you some random data so that you would you won't have this one information leak where there shouldn't be right no, i mean for the safety of the application mm -hmm. you do whatever you need to do mm -hmm. but why do you present these to the user i mean the user doesn't need this or it doesn't make any good to him or her right uh, i'm sorry i didn't, I didn't. i mean if you really need like the, the loop case or oh, yeah. some other case yeah. where you really need to read some value yeah. for the correctness yeah. of the whole program yeah yeah you do it that's fine yeah but when you i mean at that point you have predicted that there are some memory error mm -hmm. now why don't you just give the user a, just a message or something like that that Oh so read does not really mean the the read system call like a file system call right so if you're doing a file system read 
If you were to do this, then you can return a zero bytes, saying you can't read something, or you can read return. So if I want to read 10 bytes, right, and I'm not supposed to read this 10 bytes, I can return you zero, right, meaning nothing was read, right? But when they say read in the memory context, they're not talking about read, so it could be like this, right? A of 10 in a program, right? I could say I equals A of 10, and this A is reading the 10th element, which is not part of your stuff, right? So within C, there's no way for me to return error, right? I have to return some value. I mean, C does not define a notion where I can say out of bound. I cannot throw exception, I cannot do anything, right? So the read is implicit in the memory access. So, right, I can either crash this whole system at this point, but this does not return error condition. It's not a function, right? It's a part of the C thing, right? So the way they wrote the C, you know, the safe C, safe C knows that at, at this point, you, you know, the array can only go up to A of nine, right? A of 10 is illegal, but it can't tell you because that's 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 the way this is written, right? So they in in their case, let's assume that a, this returns negative one, right? Because they assume that negative one is a made up value, which you would consider to be something, do something with it, right? But they don't know what the program logic is. So in some cases, the negative one may cause you to do the right thing. In some cases, the negative one may actually make you do some good stuff. The, the, the real challenge is there's no way for, I mean, somebody knew that something is going wrong, but there's no way for you to tell the program that here you're reading this stuff and uh, I can't do anything, right? Does that make sense? So if you had a read system call like this, right? If you say, in the file system case, if you say read fi file fd buff and then, right? This is easy to deal with, right? If you're trying to read something you're not supposed to, which is what file systems do, I can return a negative one because the, the semantics of the system call says, it'll tell you how many bytes were read. So it'll tell you whether you, you read anything out of this error condition. Whereas the semantics of the memory system is you, you're not supposed to get any, any error, right? So clearly you can be, this can be solved if you had a programming language which had memory, you know, uh, range check. So if you, if you ran like Java or something, then this shouldn't happen, right? Because you're not allowed to read beyond, um, you know, so if you have a type, type checking language, right? And type checking language which checks array bounds and stuff, this won't happen, right? So that's clear, right? I mean, this, this will never happen in Java, right? Because Java does the same thing. And when it finds out that you have, you're reading something that you're not supposed to read, it'll throw an exception, right? And it's up to your program to catch the exception and do something with it or, do whatever the, the default is, right? Right? And so the, the argument is, you know, so mo many of these things can be solved if you use the proper programming language. If you talk to the programming language community, right, they do not like the fact that people still use C. How many of you have some background in programming languages, like compilers or what have you? Okay, so few of you mentioned uh, that you, you know, some of the programming languages, right? So it does a programming language. What, what is your preferred programming language? Actually, it goes for anybody, right? What's the language you prefer? Depends. No, to write programs, like write. Uh, Rapid programming? Rapid prototyping? No, no, no. no, no. Um, suppose you had to do this for a living, right? You're writing some big piece of program. No, not for toy applications, right? Hello world, anybody can do in any language, but I'm saying some, um, some serious programming, right? But well, this is for serious programs, right? This is not for, um, so one of the things that they say is like, if you're, if you're trying to debug a program, you should probably turn this off and, and face the consequences, right? So what is your preferred programming language? It may be whatever you are taught, right? So what is the, how many of you prefer C? Two, how many, three? How many prefer Java? Two, how many prefer, what else do you do? C plus plus. Two. So, what do what do, you, what do you other guys prefer? You don't prefer the program. So um, you had to prefer something to program. You had to say something, right? So, what, what do you get prefer? 
Pearl. So anyway, so the, the bottom line is, um, so there's like, like a third of the class has no preference, and the other, like few of you like C, and many of you like Java and stuff like that, right? But the programming language community would argue that real program, if you were to, if I were to give you the best programming language, best programming language should be able to do type checking, should be able to do garbage collection, but should be able to do a lot of the stuff that you have to do in C, right? If you have garbage collection, if you have if you have type checking and if you have um, array bounds checking built into the language, which we have known for a long time, then none of this would happen, right? You cannot access something that is not part of your array in Java, because there's no buffer overflow in Java because it's not, it's not possible, right? You can't access something which is not within your range, right? So there is no reason why human beings should still be using C, right? But the fact of the matter is, in this class, there are very few people who want to work in C, but in real life, a lot of people work in C, write these systems where you get maximum performance or whatever uh, reason. And because of that, we have to deal with these kind of issues. Because of those programming languages, you still have issues with buffer overflows, and you have to deal with these things at, at the uh, at layer, right? So if you had used a language which supported all the stuff, you won't be in this trouble, right? But for some reason, we couldn't convince the people to, to move to those languages, so we're kind of stuck with dealing with those issues. Um, so the, the assumption here is, you know, if you, if you get an error, you can make it continue to run by giving it some values, and for the most part, it seems to work. Um, so clearly, you can come up with examples where this is a horrib horrible idea, right? I mean, obviously, you can, you can show cases where make up some value would, would cause disastrous effect. So their goal is not to show that this is the worst system for the worst possible scenario. Their goal is to show that there exists enough, enough cases where this sort of a thing really works. So this may be another way of, of dealing with these errors where um, <coughs> for the most part, it seems like programs are, are, are doing something where errors don't really kill it and you kind of uh, process. And that's what they're trying to um, look at, right? So I think, I think they were a lot more skeptical of the system than what they make it out to. I think they were, they, uh, it looks like it's one of those, like some undergrad comes up with this crazy idea, like can we do this stuff? And then people laugh them off and then they finally said, well, maybe there's something here. And, and they kept looking at it and it looks like it's, it, it gets better every time they look because every application, it seems like you can, you can make it go a little bit further, right? Um, and some of the things you need to uh, buy into is, um, no source, no source code or not enough time debug. Essentially, the idea here is, if this is during the development process, I want to know what the error happens. So I need to be able to do something. So if I'm a program developer, I want code dumps, so I can fix the error, right? So this only makes sense when the, the, the application is deployed to the, to, the, to the customer, where if an error happens, they, you know, they have to, um, do something. They don't have the, they, they're not going to debug the program, so this will keep them going for a little bit longer, right? Um, and again, the key here is it, this provides better than no service at all. And how much is, is debatable, that's what they're trying to show, right? The, the option here is I can kill the application or I can give you something and let you go. So as long as the damage that you cause by letting you go is not worse than just killing it, you should be okay, right? In some of the cases that they explain for the for the uh, mail reader, because of the way the bug happens, if you start the uh, mail for the same uh, uh, for the same uh, user, it'll always fail because in the first thing it does is your mail program downloads all the mail and that overflows the buffer, so it'll crash. So in that case, it'll keep failing regardless of what you do. Whereas in this case, it'll get you along enough so you can go back and delete that offending message, right? This won't solve the problem, but you, you can make progress. And in many cases, you, you are running enough to go back and delete the offending message and remove that state and then keep moving, right? So the, the example, the classical example is the buffer overrun. And this is part of, it's probably the most common cause of, uh, of uh, server issues in, in um, um, in, in servers, and where you allocate a fixed size of buffer, and your program, because of a bug, you know, reads or writes past it, right? And, and the hackers use that to write something where you shouldn't write something, read something where you shouldn't be reading, and use that to uh, do all kind of nice stuff. And it's been going on since like at least like eight, eight, late 80s, and it still keeps going, right? And 
So if you can detect this is happening, you can, you can prevent some of this stuff from happening, right? You can, you can let your program go. Um, yeah, so you have to detect that this is happening and then you can, you can uh, fix it by giving some values. So the cases where it won't work is if your if you're, if you're, if you're, the value that you generate causes other side effects. So if, you, if it's being sent to other applications or if it's causing something else to happen, then this whole thing will fail. So if you depend on these values and propagate to something else, then the propagation would fail, but for the most ca cases, it does not happen. Um, so some of the benefits are its increased resilience. So all of them are debatable because within the parameters that they talk about, those are realistic, right? So it's increased resilience because this is a graceful degradation, right? But again, there is no way to prove that this is a graceful degradation. All it knows is there's a bug happens, I let you go. Um, graceful is up to you to believe whether it's graceful or not, right? I, I suspect that in many cases, like they show, it, the graceful actually is you don't even notice this is happening, right? You, you just move on and you're fine because there are some computations that are not critical to the, the what you have to do. Um, but in some cases, this will be ho horrific and those things, this will fail. And, and they haven't looked at any case where this will fail catastrophically, right? Um, increase security because now it can deal with stack overflow, right? And I think this is a good point because when you do a stack overflow, your program is reading something it's not supposed to read or write something you're not supposed to write, right? So making some results up could, I mean, may, be, may be okay because at this point, your program is already running into a loop where it's not supposed to, right? It's reading something it's not supposed to read. So whatever it's supposed to do is it's undefined, right? In the security context, you're trying to make it do malicious stuff, but by you feeding something to it, you cannot possibly do anything more malicious, right? Because you didn't let it read what it's, what it's trying to read. It didn't, you didn't let it write something that you're, it was trying to read. So in the security context, I think this is a clear win, right? In terms of functionality, it's not so clear. In terms of what the side effects you can do, it's not so clear. But in security context, you do prevent it from reading or writing what it's not supposed to do, right? So that, that it's a win. Um, this is sort of a bizarre notion, right? The, the reduced development cost. So pressure to find eliminate all disruptive bugs, right? I don't want to put this as a positive, right? The idea here is if you're a developer, now you don't have to fix all the bugs which are crashing your system. You can just dis ship it where there are bugs that, How's yeah. That what? How is that any different than now? Uh, and now you get to actually use the program as opposed to having a crash all the time. So <laughs> I, I feel this. I, I think it's a plus because people already ship software with bugs, and now the software that they ship but, with but, bugs but, but, will but, actually work like they said. But before. but at least at least I I feel guilty, right? So at least like your competitor can say, well, blah crashes hundred times a day or something, right? What they're saying is it it will never crash. I, I, I find this attitude troubling. Yeah. They said that you can give a compiler flag so that it keeps logs of when these kinds of things yeah. happen. So, I mean, if, if somebody is really looking to have software, you know, if the customer is really looking to have software that works, then they should keep track of these logs and send them to the developers. Th that, that's, a, that's a positive way to put it, right? But I, I still think that the way they present it here, it's more of, um, it sounds more negative, right? And, and, and my belief is, if this was implemented, yes, they will get all this bug reports, um, sort of like when the system crashes, now it sends a bug report, right? Like out of the application sends it. And here, it'll have to send it even if there's no crashes, because it's internally causing crashes and it's, it's fixing those, right? Um, I just feel like they'll be more complacent because no one knows this is happening internally, right? Um, Which is which is sort of bothered. I mean, they acknowledge that you know you can get into this problem, and um, 
that's nothing that we can do, right? I mean, this is this is the telling the developers that they need to develop code with no bugs, and if there's a bug, they should take it seriously and fix it, right? Whether they're going to do that or not, you have to trust them, right? Right? <laughs> it it okay, anyway. So um, that's the stuff, right? So you know, you, um, so the other other notion is a safer integration where. Um, if you add new components, you don't have to fully trust it because if, if there's any problem, it'll 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 let you go a little bit further. Um, so, yeah, the, the 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 clear negatives are it may ge generate something which may be inconsequential, or it may create something that that um, that are awful, right? I think if you do more research, if they, if they can figure out what sort of values to return, it may be possible to come up with values that. I'm good, right? I just think sometimes the right thing to do is to crash. Okay. It's just it just is because if you're in a scientific computing environment where you're using, you know, hundreds of thousands of CPUs over, you know, hours, weeks, days, months, years, if there's an error because you wrote something that has a buffer overflow, mm -hmm. you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. You need to know, and there's no reason for you to continue. Mm -hmm. The standard for writing code should be high. So how many of you will, uh, uh, um, agree with that? So you're writing a program which, let's say, has to run for a week, right? Scientific computing or, or whatever, right? And on the, you know, like the last day, like last minute before it's supposed to stop, it has a bug, right? The bug can either be inconsequential, meaning like it, it says I'm done, like there's a problem with the with the I'm done, uh, you know, you you didn't you didn't buffer overflow there and it's, it's going to crash, or it could be consequential, right? Where um, something in your code, you know, finally blows up after the uh, some of the right. What is the right thing to do? I think it's obviously to fix the bug. But um, would you like a fire failure oblivious code where you can go back to your advisor and say, "Well, it ran to completion. Here's the data." Right? You can have it both ways, though, <laughs> because that just that just as for your argument on the last slide, that just breeds complacency on mm -hmm. the developer side. Mm -hmm. So you can't say that. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, what do you, what do you, what would you guys do? It's one of those things where it's like you, know, you should eat spinach, right? We all agree that it's supposed to be good, right? But I'm saying, um, do you agree that this is the right thing to do, or yeah, it breeds complacency. It's not the right thing to do. You should go fix and all all those stuff, right? But if this was available to you. Um, I think my point is is that if you have a bug in a memory in a memory leak or, or memory overflow or something something where you did something wrong at the end of the computation, what <laughs> what proof do you have that you did anything else right? Mm -hmm. So you got a result. So what? You, you there was an error. Mm -hmm. You don't know if the error is inconsequential. Mm -hmm. You don't know if the inconsequent what you think is inconsequential is actually inconsequential. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. do it better. Be more gooder. So I'm trying to see like opposing viewpoint because I suspect that most students, including when I was a student, you're likely to give whatever result you got, even if if the system logged it and said there was like two er one error which happened on the on the seven days. It tells you where it happened, and it says it masked, and you give you have all the input you want. Um, the right thing for you to say is go to your advisor or something and say, well, sorry, uh, you know, I ran it for a week and I, now I have the, I know where it where, where failed. I'm, I'm going to come back next week, right? Um, I suspect most of us don't do that, right? You kind of bury it or you kind of move on, right? Um, so the whole thing works or works because people do that, right? So if you're going to do that, then hey, I'm going to uh, uh, latch onto your stuff too, right? Um, so, they they go through a lot of a uh, lot of uh, applications and a lot more than what is in the in the paper on, on, uh, and where these things would work, right? Um, so they acknowledge that it's not probably not good if you if you know the 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 output of this is is catastrophic, right? So if it's like the um, the CT scan or, or whatever, um, so if it is better to for it to stop, then it's it. You don't want this, but in the other case, you mentioned that you cannot probably stop it when you wanted it or, or what have you. And this is a caveat, right? So we don't know what this is. We don't know what kind of a cases where this will fail. But in the cases where the, you don't want it, you clearly don't shouldn't do that, right? 
I don't think they are very specific about this because all the cases they did shows that this is still a good thing, right? But they acknowledge that there may be cases that where this is a bad thing, so um, we, we go with that. So they go through examples of the first is the 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 um, male male client, right? So um, most of them are, you know, have to do with conversion from one format to the other format. So they expect what the output format should be. So they allocate a certain amount of buffer, given a certain input, what the output should be. But the um, the, the the real case is the the worst case size that you need is a lot bigger than what you allocated. So in the in the weird cases, you'll have a bug, right? So first they, they, they took typical bug reports, they know what, what cases fail, and they know where those fail, so they test it across those stuff. So they're not trying to do random testing like some of the papers we read earlier. They're not taking MUT, letting it run with all kinds of inputs and trying to see where it fails. They have a bug report so they know exactly where this fails, and they, they try to recreate their condition and then it will fail, right? So the, the actual system, you may never actually see what they're trying to do, right? Some of the, I think the UTF-8 to 7 conversion example that they gave, you may have used it for years and years and never have felt it, because only on the weird extreme case do you, do you cause a failure, right? But in their testing, you will always cause a failure because they already have the bug report which says where it will fail. So in that particular case, when you try to convert from UTF-8 to UTF-7, if it gets too long, it just truncated, right? So it means that your subject line may be shorter than what you expected. Your the male from or to address will be shorter than what you expected, right? I just don't understand how you can write a converter like that where you don't test the worst case. Because you may not know what the worst case is, right? I guess Google didn't exist. No, because like one of the things that they say is like if you, the UTF, uh, you know, eight to seven, people assume it's what uh, two thirds, and actually seven thirds. people assumed it was twice. Twice. It was really seven thirds. Yeah, seven thirds, right? So yeah, so. Um, this is where your algorithm class comes in, right? How, when, you, when you use data structures, right? Um, you're supposed to have studied at some point what's the worst case space requirement for something and use that, right? Uh, I never met a programmer who knows those details, right? They, they should, right? Well, if you're writing it, you look it up. You don't have to know it offhand. Look it up. I have never met a programmer. So do you guys, do you guys look it up? Like, do you guys, when you allocate the stuff, do you look at... I mean, if it's the kind of thing, if you're doing something that's standardly accepted practice, like converting a UTF-7 to a UTF-8 mm -hmm. string, then it's easy to find that on Google, but it might be something that you're defining yourself that's not quite, that's not mm -hmm. well-defined, like uh, you're taking in a name. Well, how long could somebody's name be? Mm -hmm. uh, in the, you know, like an American name is maybe, you can say 30 characters, mm -hmm. but maybe you could have like an Indian name that mm -hmm. is like when you no, put it in English. The, no, the worst name. part is when you go to UTF-8 to UTF-16, right? UTF, the UTF is, uh, I forget what the, uh, universal text format or something like that, right? So the eight says like how, how many uh, bits goes into that each character, right? So UTF-7 is each character is represented by seven, seven bits. UTF-8 is eight bits, right? UTF-16 is 16 bits to represent one thing. So in those languages, you may represent the same character A by 16 bits, right? Rather than, so if you use like some of the Asian languages, you'll need the 16 bit width. So even, if you encode my name in UTF-16, it doubles in size because each character becomes twice the thing, right? And that's a very common thing because people don't assume that um, you, you're ever going to get UTF-16. And so even if you assume that your people's name is typically 100 bytes, 100 bytes is a long name, even if the person's name is like 50 bytes, it may be in UTF-16 where uh, things get changed, right? Um, yeah, so, sorry. Oh, but I mean, if there might be something that's not well-defined, like well, how long is somebody's name? Well, I might assign a buffer that's 100 characters mm -hmm. and say no one's name is ever going to be 100 characters mm -hmm. long. But if you're in a system where you're dealing with millions of transactions every day, you're going to run into that one person mm -hmm. whose, whose mm -hmm. name is 110 mm -hmm. characters mm -hmm. long. And it's something, you know, and hopefully you're smart enough to say, well, I'll say 100 characters, but then throw an error. I'll check, you know, make sure that it actually is mm -hmm. less than that. But, you know, if you don't, you don't. It's not always easy. To and, 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 and the, and the uh, funny thing about this system is you only need one location, right? I mean, so you could be checking it 
everywhere in your program, but on this one particular stuff. So um, the, the point to remember when they, the, the analysis is, these are not typically for, for bugs where it happens all the time, right? So if you, if you read, if you assume that the, the user's name should be two bytes, and you wrote a mail program, right? You would immediately know that something is wrong because I, I guess it, most people's name is more than two bytes. So you're gonna crash all the time, right? So you have to assume some 